Oh, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Luke Mitchell? Luke Mitchell was convicted of killing Jody Jones in 2005. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So I'll start with the background on this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Luke Mitchell lived in New Battle, Scotland. This is southeast of Edinburgh. Jody Jones lived in East Houses, which was in that same area. They both attended St. David's Roman Catholic High School, and they were in the same year. Mitchell would supply Jones with cannabis, and in March of 2003, the two started having sex. At this time, they were both 14 years old. Mitchell was also in another sexual relationship that Jones did not know about. On June 30, 2003, Jones left her residence at about 5 p.m. on her way to visit Mitchell. She never arrived at her destination or returned home, so her family started searching for her. Mitchell joined them. At about 10.30 p.m., her body was found on a path in a wooded area by Mitchell and members of her family. She had been attacked with a knife, her hands were tied behind her back, and there were several slash wounds on her body. The police wondered how Mitchell was able to find Jody's body. They argued that he must have known she was there. Mitchell was the obvious suspect, and it is believed he was the only suspect. The police never seriously looked at anyone else. Ten months later, he was arrested and charged with murder. He pleaded not guilty. He would be convicted of murder and selling cannabis on January 21, 2005. On February 11, 2005, he was sentenced to at least 20 years in prison. Mitchell made numerous appeals based on a number of factors, including he was improperly interviewed by the police, he did not have access to an attorney during the interview, and his punishment was too harsh. At the time making this video, Mitchell has lost every appeal that he's filed. Before I move to the analysis, let's hear a word from the sponsor for today's video, NordPass. More and more people are working, shopping, going to school, and entertaining remotely. Therefore, digital security has become increasingly important. However, people don't seem to be dealing with security effectively. One survey indicated that 22% of people in the United States and United Kingdom have been a victim of cybercrime. 30% of those same populations find resetting passwords as stressful as retiring. As our lives become more digital, mental health is more influenced by digital behaviors. Cybersecurity is crucial to keeping our minds calm. Secure password management can be helpful in that domain. A password manager such as NordPass helps to deal with passwords more securely and effectively. Leverage technology to reduce your stress instead of increasing it. Use NordPass to generate complex passwords that are more secure. NordPass can help you stay safe online. It will recognize suspicious websites so you don't accidentally reveal sensitive information. Get 70% off and an additional month free at nordpass.com slash drgrande or use the code drgrande. Now moving to my analysis. So the question that comes up often in the case of Luke Mitchell, of course, is was he guilty or innocent? He was found guilty, but was he actually guilty? Let's look at the factors both for and against the idea that Luke Mitchell was guilty, starting with the factors pointing toward, so the inculpatory factors. On the day of the homicide, a witness saw a boy and a girl near the path where the body of Jones was found. This was at around 4.50 p.m. The witness was unable to identify Mitchell in court. The witness's description of the girl was somewhat consistent with Jones, but not a perfect match. Two different witnesses saw a boy near the end of the path about an hour later. They identified that individual as Luke Mitchell. Mitchell argued that he had an alibi, he was at his house cooking dinner when the homicide occurred. The difficulty for Mitchell was that his brother told investigators he had not seen Mitchell in the residence that afternoon. The brother said that he was viewing pornography, and he would not have done that if Mitchell or anyone else was in the house. Mitchell's mother was arrested for lying to the police because she had stated Mitchell was home when clearly he was not. She was never convicted. The police found that Mitchell owned a sheath for a knife. He had marked that sheath with the inscription JJ 1989-2003 to and a quote which read, 
The finest day I ever had was when tomorrow never came. The knife that belonged in that sheath was never recovered. It was four inches long. Mitchell has never explained what happened to the knife. Mitchell was seen wearing a parka the evening that Jody Jones was murdered. It was never recovered. The prosecution argued that he may have destroyed it in a garden incinerator, even though no evidence was recovered from that incinerator. The prosecution based this argument on the fact that neighbors believed that incinerator was putting out an unusual smell. The prosecution argued that Mitchell had an unusual interest in the 1947 homicide in California known as the Black Dahlia. The victim was an actress named Elizabeth Short. It is a notorious unsolved case. Short's body was cut in two and left on the side of the road. The prosecution argued that Elizabeth Short's murder was similar to the murder of Jody Jones. The prosecution believed that Mitchell was obsessed with both Marilyn Manson and Satanism. They essentially said that those two interests could lead to a crime like the murder of Jody Jones. A student who was friends with Mitchell said that Mitchell previously stated he could imagine smoking cannabis and killing someone. Mitchell showed the student a knife and talked about the best way to cut a person's throat. Mitchell had been exchanging text messages with Jones starting at 4.35 p.m. on the day she was murdered. At 4.54 p.m. on the day of the murder, Mitchell called a service that provides the exact time. If he was in his residence, why would he have done that? It would make more sense for him to look at a clock that was there. Mitchell was able to describe a distinctive hair fastening that Jones had been wearing, even though it was not visible when her body was found. She had not worn it to school, which is where Mitchell claimed he saw her last. Two days before the murder, Mitchell had purchased a Marilyn Manson DVD. I talked about his interest in Marilyn Manson before. This particular DVD included images of naked women tied together. Now looking at the exculpatory factors, the items that make him appear innocent, it's worth noting here that some of the issues I'm talking about in this section were raised on appeal and not during the trial. No physical evidence whatsoever tied Mitchell to the crime, so he did not have anything under his fingernails. There was no blood or DNA in his hair. There was nothing that indicated he was there. The police appeared to have a laser focus on just Luke Mitchell. For example, there were four people in the search party, including Mitchell. Only he was tested for DNA and other evidence. The evidence doesn't support the idea that Mitchell was fascinated with the murder of Elizabeth Short. He may have been exposed to it, but that's different than having some type of unhealthy obsession with it. In addition, the murders were really not that similar. It's not clear if he was really obsessed with Marilyn Manson either, so again, he had an interest, but that's different than someone who is extremely devoted to somebody like Manson. There was an alternate theory of the crime, there was another student who perhaps should have been a suspect. He used substances frequently and attended school with both Mitchell and Jones. A friend of that student said that he had many scratches on his face just after the homicide. There was also this story about how the student handed in an essay at school that was disturbing. The paper was about killing a girl in the woods. It was later determined that no such essay was ever submitted by that student. The police ruled out that student as a suspect. Considering all the evidence, both inculpatory and exculpatory, do I think Luke Mitchell was actually guilty, and do I think he was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt? So reality versus the legal standard. I think he actually did it, but I don't think he was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. I think this is a situation where the police squandered the opportunity to conduct a good investigation. The evidence that convinced me that Mitchell was guilty in reality would include how he lied about his whereabouts and when he last saw the victim, the missing knife, the missing jacket, and the three witnesses who saw somebody resembling him near the crime scene, two of whom identified him. All the stuff about Elizabeth Short, Marilyn Manson, and Satanism doesn't help, but I don't know if it caused him to commit the crime. I think it's more likely that he had fantasies of committing the crime and was drawn to those areas of interest. In an effort to be fair to the prosecution, Elevating Marilyn Manson to the position of role model is like looking to Lindsay Lohan for career advice or hiring Ellen DeGeneres to teach sensitivity training. Here's the evidence I think raises reasonable doubt. The poor police investigation, the bad identification techniques which were used with the witnesses who identified Mitchell, 
and the fact that no physical evidence was found on Mitchell at all. Even running under the assumption that he burned his jacket, it is difficult to believe that he could have used a four-inch knife to murder someone and not had DNA or blood anywhere else on him. Now, it is possible that he tied up Jody Jones first, which made it less likely that she could fight back, but she did have defensive wounds. So whoever attacked her was likely struck by Jody Jones. This case has become somewhat controversial, in part because of a documentary that was released, which excluded some of the inculpatory evidence and led people to believe that Mitchell was likely innocent. It has caused some people to demand that he be freed from prison. In that documentary, Mitchell made a few statements. When trying to explain why the police focused on him, he said, I was the local weirdo. It was easy to put it on me. He went on to say that he was framed for the murder and he will never admit being guilty, even if they offered him immediate freedom. That's a fairly safe statement to make because they're not going to offer him freedom. I don't think the documentary needed to exclude inculpatory evidence in order to make its point. Yet this is something we frequently see with documentaries about cases like this. Why does this keep happening? Why do people who make documentaries insist on leaving out key evidence? I think the idea that somebody committed a crime, but there was still reasonable doubt, is not very satisfying to people. I think the narrative that people prefer is good guy versus bad guy. Either someone is guilty or they're innocent. It seems like a technicality if somebody committed a crime and they're not convicted because the evidence doesn't support the conviction. It comes down to a discomfort about uncertainty. It's hard to fight for somebody to get out of prison if one truly believes that person is guilty. I think that's where Luke Mitchell finds himself. Again, I think the reality is that he is guilty, which is going to prevent him from getting a lot of sympathy from people, even those who believe in the rule of law. Two examples that come to mind of cases where somebody was found not guilty, but the majority of people believe they were guilty, would be O.J. Simpson and Casey Anthony. It's a bit of an understatement to say these two do not engender sympathy. If Simpson and Anthony ever started a business where they advocated for people who were wrongly convicted, I think the potential clients would just say, you know what, prison doesn't seem so bad. Public opinion about Simpson and Anthony should make somebody like Mitchell consider just serving his time. At least then, when he is released, he can say that he accepted his punishment. Due to the controversy about guilt or innocence, the part that gets missed in this case is why did Mitchell kill Jones, assuming he was in fact guilty? Without Mitchell confessing, there's really no way of knowing. He didn't appear to have any traditional motive. It wasn't jealousy, revenge, or a drug deal gone bad. Jones was not the victim of any type of assault of a sexual nature. Nothing was stolen from her. It seems like he just had an interest in killing someone, perhaps some type of fascination with death, consistent with his interest in the Elizabeth Short case and his interest in Marilyn Manson. It could be that he was just very susceptible to these fantasies and wanted to try to turn his fantasy into a terrible reality. Those are my thoughts in the case of Luke Mitchell. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this case to be interesting. Thanks for watching.